Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Glad that you're here. Welcome, whether you're in Cinecourt East or Cinecourt West, whether you're in the Woodlands, whether you're online. And while I'm uh, thinking about it, if you're worshiping with us online, our hope is that you'll still plug in to one of our grow groups and be involved in what's going on in the life of the church, particularly if you live in the Klein or the Woodlands area. If you live farther away, uh, some other part of the world, our hope is that you'll still plug into some community somewhere, wherever you are, where uh, you can find a good Bible-believing church and be in a good grow group uh, and strengthening in your faith there. So um, I'm grateful on this Thanksgiving weekend and the kickoff of Advent weekend for many things. High on the list for me, though, is the wonderful staff uh, and team that we have, and particularly today, our preaching team. And certainly one of our favorites in the rotation is Ben Stewart, who comes today to bring us a very good penetrating, thought-provoking message. So let's welcome him now as he comes to teach us God's Word. Howdy! Howdy. Good to see you guys. I hope you had a great Thanksgiving. Uh, Anyone else freaked out that he said four weeks till Christmas? I don't know why, of all the things, I'm like, wow, okay, I've got to do some shopping and some thinking about shopping. But... uh, Anyways, uh, glad y'all are here, and uh, if you've got a Bible, I want to read to you uh, a passage out of Luke chapter 5. I'm going to be jumping to a lot of different verses today, and I think you'll see why as we jump in, but I want to read to you a couple verses from Luke chapter 5. We'll pray uh, and then jump in together. Luke chapter 5, beginning in verse 15, uh, is speaking about Jesus, and it says this. But the news about him was spreading even further, and large crowds were gathering to hear him and be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus himself would often slip away to the wilderness and pray. Now, let me pray for us. Lord, thank you for for every person uh, gathered today in this moment, and I just, I'm I'm thankful we're all here, God, Uh, whether we're here and just love worshiping you or whether we're here and and aren't sure what we think about you and, and all this. I just, I'm grateful we have a moment together to, Lord willing, pull the lens back and look at the world we live in and to look at ourselves and the way we live within it. And to, my hope is, in the next few minutes, really contemplate who we want to be as we walk through our days and what it's like to live under heaven. And so, God, I just pray you'd open our eyes to see the world we're in, to see ourselves, and then to see you and what you might have for us as we live out these lives you've given us. And uh, I I pray, Lord, we could be changed by this service and and really change how we live and see you and see ourselves and see other people, but I can't generate that, and so we're asking you, God. And and I wanna invite you guys, if you're willing, to take a minute and and you ask him. uh, Pray and, and say, Lord, will you please teach me something right now? And then if you would, please pray for me, that the Lord would use me and I'd be helpful to you. Well, Father, we love you and we trust you. Use this time and we pray that in Jesus' name, amen. Well, several years ago when I was in college, I had the opportunity to climb Long's Peak. Uh, Long's Peak is the tallest mountain in the Rocky Mountains. And I did it with a buddy, and we were pretty pumped up about it, trained, got ready, woke up early that day, and began to attack this mountain. And it takes the better part of a day to hike up to the top of it. In the first several hours, we were doing fantastic. I mean, we were just charging up the mountain, passing by lesser mortals. I mean, we were feeling pretty amazing about ourselves as we went charging up this mountain, like we are owning the Rockies, people. And so I remember as we went up there, we were feeling good, passed through the keyhole, began to move through the snowbanks as we were approaching the tops of the mountain. And then all of a sudden, I remember we rounded this corner, and as we were climbing up this one steep incline, uh, it suddenly felt like someone had taken a syringe and just sucked out 
all the energy in my body. Like I suddenly felt exhausted, like at the deepest levels. And I'm like, what is happening? And I didn't want to say anything to Ben because I was a little embarrassed about it. Like, dude, I don't want to fall off at the end here. But I was like, oh my gosh, like, like we trained for this. Like we got in shape for this. Why am I feeling like horrible? Like everything in me wants to stop. And I was like, man, we got to keep charging forward. And we kept moving forward. And I just felt completely listless. And then I remember I started getting a headache and I'm like, what is my deal? Am I not hydrating enough? Let me drink more water. And as we kept going, I remember we hit a moment where suddenly I got nauseous. And I was like, what is going on? I'm like, is it the trail mix? Did I, did I mix it wrong? Like, what's going on? And I remember finally, we got to one moment where nauseous, headache, exhausted. We hit a moment where I was like, I've got to stop. And both of us, I discovered, were completely worn out. And we just sat on a rock uh, at the top of this mountain and realized we're in a heap of trouble. Like, we don't have enough juice to get down off this mountain. And I remember us praying together, and we're like, Lord, I don't want to end this way. You know, I don't want to die recreationally. Like, don't let it be this way. And I remember looking at this moment, like, what are we going to do? And, and by the grace of God, uh, a man came up our way who was an experienced mountaineer, and he began to talk to us, uh, you know, about our ignorance and those sorts of things. And uh, I remember he gave us gloves because we didn't have any in the snow and all this kind of stuff. And then he was encouraging us to continue on towards the top of this mountain. And we're like, there's no way we're going to make it. And I remember as he equipped us and spoke to us, one of the first things he said, as I remember he looked at us and he goes, well, first thing is you're breathing all wrong. And we were like, what? Like, I think I know how to breathe. You know what I mean? Like, I think I got that on lock. And he was like, no, man. He's like, you're in a different atmosphere up here. You're at 14,000 feet up in the air. He said, you're in a different atmosphere and that has to change the way you breathe. And so you guys are breathing all wrong. And I remember he began to teach us how to breathe. And as we followed him and he taught us how to breathe, I remember suddenly my head cleared. I felt some energy coming back to my body and we were able to continue. And it was one of the most fascinating experiences of my life as a young man to see changes in the atmosphere around me demand that I have to change how I act if I want to survive and I want to thrive. That when there's changes in the atmosphere, I have to change how I act if I want to survive and I want to thrive. And I mention that because it's not just true in the atmosphere, in the air, it's true culturally as well. That there are factors in our cultural atmosphere that are shifting and changing and affecting us and our quality of life. And the wise person sees what's happening in the atmosphere around them, socially, relationally, and adjusts appropriately so we can live well within it because the world is different. The last 10 to 20 years, there have been profound changes in our culture. And if the world is changing, we have to change how we live within the world. And so I want to talk to us today and next week as we think about this Advent season, a season of reflection. I want us to pull the lens back and look at the culture around us because it's different. And as we contemplate the world around us, I want us to contemplate how we want to live within it so we can survive and we can thrive. And so what I want to do with this morning is I want to talk to us about one of the most important relationships in our lives right now. And I'm not talking about your spouse. And I'm not talking about your kids. And I'm not talking about your extended family. One of the most important relationships in your life that I want to talk about right now is your relationship with this, your phone. Now, let me say this before I go any further, just to be clear. This is not a guilt trip, okay? That's not the goal of this talk, right? There's no shame in here today. And I say that because it's interesting, as I've talked to people of all ages, and I just say the sentence, hey, let's talk about your relationship with your phone. You instantly see this, like, wave of shame hit them, like they break <laughs> eye contact. And you're like, well, I didn't, say, I didn't say anything negative. It's like, phone. Like, people like... We can sense that there's an uneasiness in us about our relationships with our devices. And so there's no judgment here today. There's no shame here today. My goal today is to give us information for informed decisions. That's what today is. That we can look at the world and say, this is the world we're in. And this is who I want to be as I live within it. Because the reality is there's been drastic changes in the last 10 years. And they've affected the way we see God, see ourselves, and treat other people. And so I want to see the atmosphere and then see how we want to act within it. And here's the reality. I work with college students, millennials. And it's interesting to even think about that. How do we break up generations? You know, it used to be like by war, major cultural events. We we talk about this new generation as millennials, people in their 20s and younger. And it's not just because they grew up in the new millennium. It's because the technological changes in their lifetime have been drastic 
And it's affected not only their lives. This isn't a talk about the kids. It's affected all of our lives. What's happened in the last 20 years? And so I want to talk about that. And I just want to give you a glimpse as we start as to what's been happening in our world technologically in the lifetime of the current college student. So freshmen in college today were born in 1997, okay? Let me say that again because I feel like that's still settling into some of you. (laughs) Freshmen in college were born in 1997, all right? The seniors were born in 1994. So that's the millennial college generation today, okay? Now, when they were born, the internet was just becoming something that was widely publicly used. The internet didn't have wide public use until the early 90s, all right? And so fifth-year seniors, the year they were born, there were only 600 websites on the internet. Total. In existence. And some of you are like, I serve 600 websites a week. (laughs) Yes, and back in the 90s, you would have been done. You would have been like, okay, I got them. And so there just wasn't a lot of browsing, right, in the 90s. Seniors in college, the year they were born, laptops were first becoming a thing, right? Like, I can carry my computer somewhere? That's crazy. I mean, they still weighed like 30 pounds, but it sort of felt more portable, right? Now, somewhere around 89% of college students carry laptops, right? Juniors, when they were born, this crazy new thing called email had arrived on the scene. And you remember it blew our minds when AOL and Hotmail were saying to us, you've got mail. And we're like, on my computer? What? I mean, it was crazy, right? Sophomores, when they were born, the Nintendo 64 came out, right? I have nothing relevant to say about that, other than I thought that was interesting. (laughs) Freshmen, Google was invented the same year they were. And it's interesting to teach that to young people as we talked about this with them. I was like, just think about that. Like, before you came on the scene, no one ever Googled anything. Like, if you would have said that to them, they wouldn't even know what that meant. It would have sounded inappropriate, like, hey, we don't do that in my family. You know, like, you don't even know what that word is until you showed up. And yet the reality is, once that happened, man, the world began to move so fast. Like, you could own a cell phone in the 80s, but it would have cost you $4,000, okay? But in the 90s, it began to accelerate this whole world of beginning to communicate to one another. And for you 16-year-olds in the world, 16-year-olds texting wasn't possible across phone networks until the year you were born, 1999. So we weren't texting each other until almost the year 2000, right? Now there are more texts and phone calls. MySpace was created in 2004. It was the most visited website in 2006, okay? Less than 10 years ago, the most visited. We're like, this MySpace thing is the greatest, right? YouTube was created in 2005. Facebook wasn't available to non-college students until 2006. Twitter launched in 2006. Instagram in 2010. Snapchat in 2011. Selfie didn't even exist, that word, until two years ago. And the iPhone was created in 2007. Eight years ago. So think about that for a minute. This whole world of carrying the internet, the World Wide Web around with you in your pocket everywhere you go hasn't really been a thing except for like maybe the last eight years. That's pretty profound to think about the changes that have happened to our lives in that time. High school kids, when you were in elementary school, less than half of high school students owned a cell phone of any kind. Now when you're in high school, 95% do. So I just want you to think about that over the last few years. Over the lifespan of our current college students, we went from, so what's this internet? To 73% of us report in surveys, we feel lost and confused if we leave the house without this. Right? You ever done that? It's terrifying, isn't it? (laughs) Get in the car and you're like, "Ah! I'm, I'm untethered, I'm just out here. You need to like hug somebody, right? (laughs) We freak out. So what's normal now didn't exist 10 years ago, five years ago, two years ago, right? It's crazy. I tell college students, imagine living a life where you didn't carry around a phone. Imagine having no social media sites to keep up with. Nothing to 
like, nothing to post. Imagine none of that. For our students in college, up until their junior high years, that's how all human beings everywhere lived always. So the changes have been significant for us, right? Dimitri Christakis is a pediatrician who studies media and children. And he says we are in the midst of a large, uncontrolled experiment on the next generation. He says technology is moving so fast we, we can't even lock in long enough to, to figure out what's going on. We're in the midst of a live, uncontrolled experiment. He says our young people today are the guinea pigs and we don't know what we're doing to them and what's going to happen to them, right? So question, is this where I start to trash technology? Is this the point in the talk where I make you all feel bad about owning a phone and be like, so you gotta throw your phones away and we're all going to Montana. We're gonna grow out beards, churn our own butter. Like, is that what we're gonna do? No, because here's the deal. This isn't a guilt trip, right? And let me just go ahead and state the obvious. There's upsides to the technological advances we've had today. There are. I don't miss driving around with paper maps. I don't miss that. I don't miss having to find an Encyclopedia Britannica every time I have a question, like, where are my books? Like, I don't miss that. I don't miss having to drive to Blockbuster Video every time I want to watch a movie and be like, oh, they only had three of them. Like, I don't miss that day, right? And so there's obvious upsides to having the technological advances we do, right? The, the two, I won't belabor this, but the two big ones are information and connection that we can access information instantaneously, that I can know what's going on on the other side of the world now, right? And not just information, but connection. I can find out about a crisis on the other side of the world in seconds, and automatically we're building pipelines of us being able to send things to help them and relieve suffering, right? The information we have and connection we have. You can keep up with people you met overseas or met in high school in ways that were unimaginable when many of you were kids. The information's incredible. The connection's incredible. At any moment, a whole world of information can be accessed anywhere. But that's also part of the problem. Because an endless stream of information can be tapped into in any moment, it has invaded every moment. Because we can access this little portal of information anywhere, it's invaded our lives everywhere. So the cyber company, uh, security company, Lookout Incorporated, did a, a mobile mindset study, and here's what they found about us. Tell me if this is true of you. It says that 58% of all users do not go one hour without checking their phones, regardless of whether or not it dings or anything, right? Every hour, we check it right? The majority of us. Over half of us check it while in bed. That means before we go to sleep, when we wake up in the middle of the night, and the first thing when we wake up in the morning. Over half of us check the phone. First thing, last thing before we fall asleep, first thing when we wake up in the morning. 39% of us check it while using the bathroom. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but um, vast majority of us, right? 30% of us will check our phones while we're at a meal with another human being. 24% of us will get online on our phones while we're driving, which personally, I think that one's a little low. I think people are just don't want to admit that because I look at people when I drive and everybody's doing this, right? And we're going to, we're going to kill each other, right? I got kids. So I watch people get off your phones, right? 9% of us, one out of 10, check our phones during church services. Isn't that interesting? So one out of every 10 of you have been checking something online since I've been talking, right? So there's no shame. I'm just pointing you out, okay? (laughs) But here's the reality. It comes at a cost. And the reality has a horrible irony to it. Let me tell you what it is. We have unlimited access to information today like we never had before. But here's the crazy thing. It's not making us more intelligent. I read a study uh, from researchers in Europe that notes that the average IQ in Western nations has dropped 14 points since the 1900s. So we're not smarter than the 1900s. And not only are our IQ dropping, part of the big problem that studies are finding is we are more fractured in our minds and that makes us less able to focus on tasks. Microsoft did a study of Canadians 
And they found that the average human attention span in the year 2000 was 12 seconds. In 2013, eight seconds. And to give you a reference point, that is less than the attention span of a goldfish. <laughs> so one of the researchers, Satya Nadella, said this, we are moving from a world where computing power was scarce to a place where it's almost limitless, where the true scarce commodity is, increasingly, is human attention. That we have more information, but it's not made us more intelligent, it's made us more fractured. And the ever-present opportunity for connection has made us disconnected from the world around us. Here's the stat that got me. In 2014, the average American spends 7.5 hours a day looking at a screen. And I remember when I first read that, I thought, that feels inflated. And then I read what they meant by screens. Televisions, computers, tablets, phone. And so I just analyzed my own life. And I hit 7.5 hours a day, easy. Easy. And, and I'm not trying to shame you if you were. Some, you got to get on a computer. You got to check your phone. I'm not shaming anybody, but here's the thing. As I looked about that, I'm like, yeah, we do. I hit a screen. I'm looking at a screen seven and a half hours a day. But as I pulled the lens back, I had to ask the bigger question, do I want that to be true of me? When I'm dead, do I want it to be said of my life that half my waking hours were spent looking at a screen? And if I don't want that to be true of me, what changes am I willing to make? Sherry Turkle's a professor at MIT, and in 1995, it was so interesting, in 95, she wrote a book called Life on the Screen, in which she celebrated the possibilities available to us in these online personalities. And it was a call for all of us to dive into the internet connections available to us to explore our personalities online. Then she wrote a book a few years ago entitled Alone together, why we expect more from technology and less from one another, in which she calls for restraint. And she says, drawn by the illusion of companionship without the demands of intimacy, we confuse posting and online sharing with authentic communication, and we are drawn to sacrifice conversation for mere connection. And she warns, what technology makes easy is not always what nurtures the human spirit. The same person who was calling us to dive in and explore is now saying this is taking things from us that were good. And studies are showing increasingly in young people decreased social skill because most of communication now is in text. Real life communication is difficult for some, and I've seen this. There's an increase in flakiness in the world today, and that's across generations, and it's true. Because how many of us know it's true? It's much easier to break commitments on a text, right? Why? Because I don't have to look at your face. So I read one study where they did it with teenagers who had a standing dinner appointment with grandma, and they had them break the appointment on text. And guess what? Easy. Easy. Sorry, grandma, I'm not going to make it. Boom, right, and done. Go do something else. But the kid that had to call grandma and hear the disappointment in her voice he was like, eh, maybe I can figure some stuff out, right? <laughs> the human connection of hearing the break in her voice, of having to look into her eyes and say that, that humanity changed our behavior. But if I don't have to look at your face, I can break commitments to you. And also, it's, there's an increase in insensitivity. And I could go on and on about that online. We've all seen that. There was a report out today. A woman a news reporter was uh, criticizing Star Wars because she said she didn't like it. And she got hundreds of responses online calling for her to be raped and murdered. And that's not a joke. Raped and murdered because she disagrees with your movie selection. I don't think a fraction of them would ever say that to her face. But they don't have to look at her face. They don't have to look at the horror in a crowd if they would have said that out loud with their mouths. They can just slash it off on a computer. And many of us in here would never say something that hurtful, but how many of us retreat, we repost articles, things, statements, quotes that, that are diminishing to another human being? I can disagree with your ideas, but do I dehumanize you? And where we dehumanize people, we give ourselves permission to be inhumane. And that's happening in our culture today in America. It's a problem. And what I think is the most serious issue is a decrease in reflection. 
that this increase in connection with different portals online has disconnected us not only from us, but it's disconnected us from ourselves. Because here's the reality. A few years ago, when you're alone at a stoplight or laying in bed before you fall asleep or walking somewhere, what happened in those moments as the loneliness creeps in and the ache and discomfort of it? Who was there? You and God. And so in that moment, you either reflected on your own life and reflection in the midst of that discomfort led to insight. Or you meditated on the words of God or prayed to God and that connection with God led to deeper intimacy. But now, instead of intimacy and insight, we go for distraction, right? And the distraction robs us of the insight and the intimacy that comes in those moments where we stay in the pain. Loneliness is not a problem to be solved. When we sit in it, often God uses that ache of being alone to send us into deeper insights about ourselves in him. How many prayers have been lost in the last five years? Because now when I lay in bed, I just access the world on my phone. And here's the thing. I'm not beating you up for checking your phone in bed. You can do that. But here's the reality that gets me. We fill every quiet moment. And it's not just the kids. I think for so many of us in a talk like this, we want to go, yeah, I know. These kids today going to hell in a handbasket. <laughs> the Entertainment Software Association put out marketing about gamers. What's the average age of a gamer in America today? Video game player. 31. There are more gamers over 36 than there are in the bracket of 18 to 35. And you go, how can that be? I don't play Halo, but you play on this. And so there are more gamers over 36 than there are between 18 and 35. So before we start judging the kids, we got to look at ourselves, right? I've watched a grandma be in the same room with the grandkids and be playing a video game on her phone, right? Now, am I saying grandma can't play Candy Crush? No, <laughs> play a game, grandma, relax a little bit. And you can too. Some of you need to decompress and just, you know, play with some bouncing around monkeys. I don't care what you do. But the reality is, if it's invaded every moment, we have to acknowledge it is taking some things from us, right? And so here's what we do that I think is really difficult for us. Why do we go to this? For distraction, sure, but we go to it not for connection often. You know what we go for it, to it for? For comfort, right? For comfort, and we go to it for uh, company. It's an escape from the discomfort of our lives. And here's the reality. I do this. I've done it. I went to a football game the other day, and I was showing up at an Aggie game, and I was early, which I'm never early, but I'm standing around because I'm super early, and I came by myself, which I never come by myself. And so suddenly I was in this moment where it's this big social moment, all these people around talking to their friends and I'm there by myself in that moment and it was extremely uncomfortable. And the first thing I did without even thinking about it was whoosh, pulled out my phone and just started looking for something. And I stopped and I was like, what are you looking for? And I'm like, anything, anything to look busy. <laughs> and I was like, why am I doing that? I'm not doing it for me necessarily, I'm doing it for y'all. So that y'all can go, that guy's got something going on. Because if I'm just standing there, not on the phone, they're like, he's a psycho, someone's gonna call the cops on me. Like I gotta look at the phone just so, you, so it can look like I got something going on. And I didn't do it because I was trying to access any data. I did it to escape discomfort. I did it going for comfort. And for many of us, we do that. Alone in our rooms, anywhere, all throughout the day, we dive into this to get a little hit, a little buzz of feeling good, right? Uh, I listened to a director talk about that the other day. He says, I can't, so I can't stand the silence because in silence, I think about my life and whether or not it has any meaning. He said, so I have to keep myself busy. And so the cost of all this is that it's made us more self-absorbed but less self-aware. And it's given us invasion and distraction, which has actually led us to feel isolation from God, from other people, even ourselves. And so you hear this and you go, wow, Ben, this is a really upbeat talk. Thanks, this is awesome. What are we supposed to do with this? Let me give us three things real quick in our time together. What do we do? Well, the first thing I would point us to is salvation that we look to our phones, our TV screens, our screens to, to help us escape the discomfort of ourselves sometimes. I don't wanna be alone with me because I know conviction would come. So I distract from it, why? Because we know we don't feel okay. And so we look for something to give us novelty. It's interesting in the Old Testament, the book of Hosea, 
Hosea is a prophet and he marries a woman that is living with him, but she decides, I want to experience what the world has to offer. And so she takes the ache in her heart and she sends it out, not onto a phone that didn't happen back in the Old Testament. She took it to the city because that's where the action was. And she began to explore whatever she could, um, intellectually, relationally, in parties, and then sexually, right? And as she began to do that, she experienced what a lot of us do is we begin to experiment and explore in places we go because we think the world will give us something, but by the end, we feel like it's taken something from us. And this woman had given her body away over and over again in the search for fulfillment. And she found it didn't fill her, it left her empty. And by the end of it, she had not been given by the world, she'd been used by it. And in the book of Hosea, by chapter two, she's on a slave block, being sold. And people aren't wanting to pay full price for a woman that's used up like that. And God tells Hosea, go and buy your wife back. Your wayward wife who ran from you, speak sweetly to her and draw her in to find the true satisfaction of being loved, body and soul, by her husband. And Hosea did it because it's a picture of God with his people. So Hosea 2.14 says, therefore behold, I will allure her. This is God speaking of us who've taken our aches to a million places to find the hit of novelty rather than taking it to the one who made our souls. And he says, I will allure her, bring her to the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. And there I will give her her vineyards and make the valley of trouble a door of hope. And there she shall answer as in the days of her youth at the time when she came out of Egypt. And in that day declares the Lord, you will call me my husband and no longer call me my Baal. He says, I'm gonna pull you out into the wilderness, not to smash you, but give you your vineyards back. Not to hurt you, but to give you life. And you're gonna call me not my master. I'm not here to taskmaster or hurt you. You're gonna call me my husband, the lover of my soul. He says, when I pull you away from these things that can't satisfy the depths of your heart, I will reintroduce you to me. That God is the satisfaction of your heart. When Jesus showed up on the scene in Mark chapter two, the Pharisees asked him why your disciples don't fast and said they don't fast because the bridegroom is here. And he took that Old Testament image of God being the husband and he says, those are about me. I'm the son of God. I'm the husband who comes to his people who have searched so many places to find their soul satisfaction and they can't find it and I have come that they may find it in me. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. And so the first thing I would call you to do is throw down lesser treasures and come to the one who's the only perpetual novelty, the infinite God who's come to us through his son, Jesus Christ. And I would call you not just to salvation, but to meditation. It's something fascinating about that. Did you see when God was calling his people back? Did you hear what he said? He said, I will call her to the wilderness and speak tenderly to her there. God wants her in the desert to speak to her. And go, why? Why? And you realize he's been doing that all through the Bible. That Abraham, when he called Abraham in Genesis, called him out to the desert. Jacob called him to the desert. Moses called him to the desert. The entire nation of Israel out of Egypt into the desert. King David, Hosea, Jesus loved to go out there. Why is God so crazy about the wilderness, the desert? For a simple reason. Because there's no other people out there. Because there's not a lot of stuff going on that when God wants to speak depth and life into his people, he takes them to places where there's no distraction. So let me call you as we think about our lives and who do I want to live, go to Jesus Christ for salvation. When you sit and feel that lonely ache before you take it to distraction, take it to him. And then I would say in the quiet places, reserve in your life places for meditation meditation, that I will steal away to the quiet places to meet with my God. Because here's the reality. Speed is the enemy of depth. You see it in boats. Faster you go, the shallower you get. And so you got to go fast sometimes. You do. And Jesus went fast sometimes. There were moments in Jesus's ministry where he didn't have time to eat. He was hustling, making moves, getting stuff done. Some of you are busy people. You do a lot. You interact online, interact on the computer, and you have to do that. And I'm not smashing on that. You go, you do it. You get things done. And yet Jesus would do that. But in the text we read, he would be out there working. And in Luke 15, it says news about him was spreading. He was getting more popular. He was blowing up online. All these people were following him. It's going crazy. And it says, but he himself would often slip away into the wilderness to pray. That Jesus said, I will go into the moments of crazy and then I will step out into the moments of quiet. I will engage the world and then I will disengage for meditation. And you see it all through his life. 
And you see, in Psalm chapter one, it talks about blessed is the man who delights in the law of the Lord. On it, he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and its leaf does not wither. Some of you are wondering, how do I be a strong person who's fruitful, that has good things to offer those I love, whose leaf doesn't wither, that in the midst of difficult seasons, I continue to thrive. How do you do that? God says, it's by my blessing. Where does the blessing come? In meditating on my words that I push the distractions away so that I can sit with the words of God and drink in deep from it and let it make me strong. It's interesting, when Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? He quoted Deuteronomy 6, where it says, love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your might. And then you're asked, how do you do that? What's interesting, Deuteronomy 6 unpacks it. It says, these words I command you shall be on your heart. How do you do that? Teach them to your children. Talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise. Did you hear what he said? How do I love God with my mind and my heart? He says, you talk about him. Talk about him when you lay down. Talk about him when you get up. Talk about him when you walk. Talk about him when you sit. And you go, Ben, lay down, rise, talk, sit. That, that's when I'm on my phone. Right. Right. And here's the reality. You got to check your phone. People are gonna call you, people are gonna text you, people are gonna email you, you gotta check your phone. What I'm, I'm not saying throw away your phones. Check your phones. What I'm saying is, for many of us, it's invaded every moment of our life and I'm saying carve out some moments where they can't have you. They can't get to you. That I'm gonna sneak away into the wilderness with just me and God. I had to realize for myself, and it was so sad to have to admit it about myself, I can't do a devotional time with God on my computer or my iPad or whatever, I'm too easily distracted by little baubles. Ooh, that's funny, right? I just get too distracted. And and so I realized Ben can't handle this. Maybe somebody can, I can't. So I had to go analog with the whole thing. Every day I create space where I pull out a Bible, like like the book kind made with paper. And I pull out a piece of paper and I write out my thoughts and I write out the Bible with a pen using my hand. And it's slow And I don't get very far in writing because my hand cramps, right? But I get depth back. And I want that for me. And I need that for the Lord. So I've had times where I have to step away from my phone. So I would encourage you, find times you check check your phone. Check it when you first sit down at work. Check it when you're drinking coffee. That's fine. And then just find the moments in your life where you don't. Where you say, the phone can't be in this moment. I'm turning the computer off, I'm putting the iPad away. For me, I can't take my iPad upstairs. Looking at the screen late at night, I just start clicking around and I stay up later than I want and I'm not who I wanna be in the morning, so I realized I gotta leave that thing downstairs and I gotta read actual physical books uh, to help me go to sleep. And the last thing I would say is leave space for conversation. Conversation. Mark chapter six, Jesus' disciples had gone out and done incredible ministry. They came to Jesus, told him all that they said and done. It's an expansion moment in Jesus' ministry. Now he's doing it through the apostles. They came back and they're like, this is blowing up. We're casting out demons. We're calling people to salvation. This is insane. Let's go, let's roll. And Jesus talked to him that moment. He says, come away by yourselves to a desolate place. Rest a while. And he took them out to a desolate place. Same word as the wilderness. That man, I'm gonna look for salvation and no one but Christ alone. I'm gonna create in my day moments of meditation where it's just me and him. And then I'm gonna preserve moments of conversation with other people. And I'm not gonna let the internet distract me from that. I have a group of young people that as we were talking about these issues, they said, Ben, you know what we've had to do? They said, we go out and we've scheduled dinners with our friendship group, our community. And we don't wanna miss that moment of community. And so what we've realized we have to do is as soon as we sit down for dinner, we all pull out our phones and we stack them in the middle of the table. And if you check your phone at any point in dinner, you have to buy everyone's dinner. (laughs) And they said, but it was fascinating because the first thing when you set the phone down and put it away, they go, there'll be moments in the conversation where the conversation lulls. And for them, they're like, as soon as the conversation lulls, we're not sure what to say. Like the hand, they're like, I'm not even controlling it. You know, and they're like, what is that? No, it's too expensive, right? And they realized... (laughs) where I would instinctively go for the phone to eliminate this moment of discomfort. Now I have to live into it and it forces my mind to think about things I'm gonna say to you, right? And I'll tell you, for me, a couple months ago, I had a good friend that I just had to get out. I had to get in the wilderness. We drove to Big Bend together and we had 10 hours in the car and we talked about all the stuff, you know, we're talking, how are the kids? How's work? How's this? And we did that for a few hours and we ran out of small talk and so we had to sit in silence for a while. And it was okay. We survived it. And not only did we survive it, that silence forced us to have to think about what to talk about. 
and we began to talk about the deeper things. Where do we want to go in life? What would need to change to, to make us that kind of man and to get us to that kind of place? And it was profound. And we need to create that space with the people we love. Uh, I talked about this issue and I had a worship leader come up to me afterwards and he said, Ben, dude, he said, this week, he said, my three-year-old was acting crazy. He said, and we looked at her and was like, what's the matter with you? Calm down. Like, you need to go do something. And she was like, I don't have anyone to play with. And he said, well, we don't have time to set up a play date right now. You just need to go play in your room. Go play in the other room. And he said, she said to me, well, if you and mom would put down your phones and play with me, I wouldn't act like this. And, and that was just well done. I mean, you know, bravo to the three-year-old because he said that just got through the armor and ugh. And he said, you know, Ben, I realized I got to check my phone. That's where I do most of my work. He goes, but I got I to gotta protect that space with my kids. I don't want them to feel like they're fighting for dad's attention for this. This portal into other worlds will not be a shield that blocks me from my kid. And for me, I've realized I only get two waking hours with my kids when I get home from work. They go to bed at seven. So from five to seven, that's my time with my kids. And I've realized I gotta get all my electronics physically away from me because I, they can't be near me because I wanna be near to them. And I wanna live by pri my priorities and not by proximity. And that's the blessed thing. We don't have to be slaves to this. We don't. When Jesus sat with Martha and Mary in Luke chapter 10, do you remember Martha was anxious about many things? And Jesus said to her, only one thing's necessary. And it's what Mary chose, and it's the good thing. It was sitting with him. And it's funny for me, as I prepared this talk, I remember there were moments where I decided to leave my iPad at home, not check my phone during certain hours. That voice in my head would say, you have to. You gotta check your phone. You gotta check your, and I stopped and I'm like, wait a second. What do you mean I have to? I don't have to. You don't tell me what to do. I don't have to check my phone. Nobody's calling me. I'm here with all the people I love. They're all in this room. There's no one I need to talk to right now. And I remember I began to speak back to that voice that demands my energy go here. And I went, no, only one thing is necessary, and it's not you. Right? These things are great tools. No shame in it. Great tools. But they're bad masters. And it doesn't need to own me. Right? And man, there's a world of good. Mary chose the good portion, and it will never be taken away from her. When I decide to look and ask the question, who do I want to be in this world? I want to be a lover of Jesus Christ, the satisfier of my soul. I look to him for salvation. I want to be a meditator on the words of God because that's what makes me a fruitful man. I'm going to choose meditation. And then I want actual communication with the people around me, the human beings that God has entrusted to me and put in my world of my neighbors and my family and my friends and my coworkers. I don't want to miss them. And so I love what technology's done for us, but it won't, own, it won't own us. It doesn't have to. We can be masters of our lives, living out our priorities and not just proximity. And man, the wealth of blessing that will come for those of us who could live like that. Let me pray for us. Well, Lord, I wanna pray for any in this room who um, don't know what salvation is, that the message of the gospel is that all of us are broken. We're all a mess. And Jesus came not to beat us up, not to condemn, not to try to motivate us to be better. He came to be a savior, to be the satisfier of our souls. And I pray there might be some people that, man, they're trying to find satisfaction and how many likes they get, how many, how many people pay attention to them. And they realize all this pursuit of novelty hasn't made us feel more alive. We need the perpetual novelty of an infinite God because that's what our soul was made for. I pray there'd be some people here today that could come home into the embrace of our husband and our king, Jesus Christ. And then God, I pray for us as we live out our days, I pray you'd give us a vision of where our wilderness is. What are the moments we could say, I'm gonna set down distraction for the purpose of meditation on the eternal words of God and let those words shape how I think and how I live. Give us a vision of where in the house that might be, where in our day that might be. And then, Lord, I pray for our communication. Show us what it might be like as a family. Show us what it might be like for ourselves. That I pray as we drive away from here, it wouldn't instantly be trying to drive conviction home into our spouses or kids, but we could let it start in our own hearts of going, what, what should I change? Not to feel guilty about getting online, but to have it in its proper place 
and then to open up other places where I'm fully present with the people I love and God's entrusted me to. What might it look like? God, may we preserve communication and find that we get depth. Give us depth with you, God. Give us depth with the people we love. And may those deep roots produce great fruit in our lives as we live the way you intended. Be glorified in us by your grace and for your glory. Amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hi, and welcome to Postscript. I'm Lou Ann Riley, Grow Group Director, and I am here with Bible teacher Ben Stewart. Welcome back, Ben. Thanks. So good, good to have you back. Yeah. Uh, did your family have a good holidays with all your little ones? You have three now? Uh, yes, yes, we did. You know, the, the people came to us, which was wonderful. So we didn't have to travel. When you have little, that's so yes. really such a gift. Good, so, good. Yeah. Well, I love the message that you brought today. It's very relevant as we look at technology and what an integral part of our lives, all of our lives, it has become. Right. Um, and you really challenged us to, in this Advent season in particular, to really evaluate our lives and, and um, begin to implement maybe some changes that create some more margin or space for time and meditation with God. Mm -hmm. um, I would say just for myself, as I start evaluating and thinking about my family, that there's challenges that I can think of. How do you go about kind of navigating that in a family? Where do we start trying to implement maybe some changes? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, um, I would say maybe to start a couple things, you know, for me, it, it helps me personally to go, let's not start with shame, you know, because the, the gospel doesn't motivate life change through shame, you know, and, and we don't have to do that to ourselves or to other people. So I think it's good to not beat yourself up or feel bad, but to just go, let's start opening our eyes and be aware of how our family interacts with the technology in our lives in good ways and in bad ways. And then for me, I would say, let that awareness and evaluation start with yourself. I think sometimes with a sermon like this, it's easy to go, yep, those kids today, you know, and you go, well, the kids weren't creating Google. So in a sense, we did this to them. So let's not blame all the children. Or we want to look at a spouse and go, well, he does. You know, let, let's just start with ourselves and go, um, what changes could I make to make sure I'm prioritizing the greatest commandment to love God and love people? I, those are non-negotiables in my life. And let me create that sacred space in my own life. And then I would say, as you approach your family, not with shame, but with conversation, you know what I'm saying? Um, I think we all have to use it, but are there ways we could create sacred space in our mm -hmm. family where we go, not here? Mm -hmm. And for some people, they would say dinner is that moment sure. of going like, mm -hmm. no technology comes to the dinner table and we'll have conversation there. And maybe someone in the family comes up with a way to we have topics or questions we can ask or make that a, a memorable moment other than we're just all here to eat in the same spot and then leave. I think that's a good place to start. I've seen other families with little kids like mine. You know, I have to say when I get home, I know a place on the counter. I set my phone. Mm -hmm. I go, I won't pick it up from there. Now, sometimes I do know there's something I have to check, you know, when there's mm -hmm. someone who's ill or whatever. But if I don't have an instant like Donna's out of town and it buzzes, then I'm going to leave it. You know, like if there's no medical issue or something, I won't touch it. But I've just created in my own mind, I know at five it goes there mm -hmm. and it stays there till seven. And I think it's good to do that. Mm -hmm. for, for me, the studies have shown um, that watching screens late at night before bed actually impairs your ability to fall asleep. And so yeah. I've realized for me, I can't take it there. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and so I would say, start with yourself, analyze your life, get awareness around it, and then start the conversation as a family. We all have ways we're gonna connect to technology. Let's start talking about places mm -hmm. we could put it away and come to consensus as a family, who are we gonna be, rather than just uh, conviction of you always do this. You know, yep. Let's all face the problem together instead of making each other the problem. That's really good. And I liked how you, um, not only engaging the word in those sacred spaces are engaging each other, but engaging in community and right. the relationships that um, God has put in your life um, that you may not see if you're tied to the world that's out there on social media. Um, you know, so, Paul yeah. told Timothy, be a student of yourself. Mm 
And that's been one of the most liberating things for me to think about. I'm just mm. going to study my life. Why do I do that? Mm. Why do we do that? I don't want to do that anymore. Mm. And I think when you come at it like a problem like that, mm. it's, um, it's more fun to meditate on and not just feel beat up and defeated. Or, or like having to meet these yeah, guidelines. Some, some yeah. list. No. Uh -uh. Yeah, that's yeah. good. Good. Well, thank you. Sure. Always a challenging message um, and lots to think about. And we get to have you back next week. That's right. Yes. All right. So yeah. excited to Bring hear from on. you again. And thank you for joining us here for Postscript. We'll see you back here next week too. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org slash postscript.